I want to begin by thanking Richard and Kevin and Masa and everyone at the Akeda Center for organizing such a, a splendid event. And thanks also to my co-panelists, Virginia Ann and Bernice, for a stimulating conversation at our dinner last night and for wonderful presentations today, to which I'm going to allude uh, in, in my own talk. And we really have had a chance to uh, harmonize our approaches to this forum's theme. It's a real challenge for a philosopher to speak for 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> on any topic, let alone such an important one. So let me read to you some thoughts that I've set down to try to remain a little bit focused in this time that we have. Cultivating uh, the greater self was a preoccupation of many sages, schools, and traditions of antiquity. Three of the most important and successful in this regard were the Stoics, the Taoists, and of course, the Buddhists. With that in mind, let's look first at a thumbnail sketch of how each of these three traditions conceives and ultimately cultivates the greater self. Then let's briefly ponder how some Western traditions have failed rather spectacularly at this cultivation and instead have succeeded in cultivating the lesser self, thus reaping a harvest of bitter fruit. Some of us talked about this at lunch too, where the food was sweet. Third, I will summarize for you a recent case study from my philosophical practice which illustrates the necessity of appealing to the greater self, not only to transcend personal regret and sorrow, but moreover to do good in the world. In the process, I will build upon and amplify aspects of Daisaku Ikeda's very useful and instructive contrast between our lesser and greater selves, which you have received in your handout. The Stoics, understood the lesser and greater selves perfectly well. Zeno of Citium, the founder of Stoicism, an advocate of a life of virtue in accord with nature, realized that suffering arises from our own erroneous judgments about ourselves, others, and the world. He also knew full well that the exercise of reason alone is not sufficient to overcome negative emotions and destructive passions, but vitally, he realized that our wills can command our judgments and therefore via our judgments can indeed govern our emotions. But like all arts, this requires practice. And that's, this is why the cognitive psychologists like Frankel, the existential cognitive psychologists like Frankel and Albert Ellis had tremendous empirical success because uh, they, they were all also grounded in this, in this ancient Stoic tradition. Yes, I'm saying just what you said, Bernice, in a different way. Epictetus, the celebrated Roman Stoic put it this way, everything has two handles, one by which it can be born, the other by which it cannot. The lesser self is the one who cannot bear things without great difficulty. For example, the lesser self cannot bear adversity or enmity or calumny and so reacts with anger, greed, envy, and so on. Whereas the greater self can bear adversity or enmity or calumny or whatever circumstances present themselves. In Stoic terms, the greater self is the handle by which all things can be born. And the Stoics prescribed exercises that strengthen the habit of handling circumstances in this way. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, who was in fact tutored by the writings of Epictetus, who was a freed slave. Marcus Aurelius was an emperor. And he, and he said, say to yourself in the early morning, this is one of the Stoic exercises, say to yourself in the early morning, I shall meet today ungrateful, violent, treacherous, envious, and uncharitable men. And, and these days, women too. <laughs> and all of these things have come upon them through what? Through ignorance of real good and ill. Isn't that the Buddhist message too? This, the Stoics had figured this out. It's ignorance. They don't understand their life conditions. And so they form erroneous judgments and are unhappy. And he says, I shall never, I shall neither be harmed by any of them, nor can I be angry with my kinsmen or hate him. Why? For we have come into the world to work together. Pretty good for an emperor. <laughs> the Taoists understood this just as well. They named their two handles yin and yang. Lao Tzu took pains to emphasize their inevitable complementariness. Greater and lesser require one another for coexistence. Like all complementary pairs, absent one, we could not recognize the other. So we recognize truth and virtue of understanding falsity. 
We recognize light in virtue of understanding darkness. We think about life in virtue of our knowledge of death and so forth. These things are intertwined vitally. This is a Taoist analog of what Daisaku Ikeda is saying in a Buddhist context concerning the relation between our lesser and greater selves, for they are not separate entities. There is no separate entity. And this is also a, a, a Taoist analog, therefore, of the interpenetration of the two. The yin has a little yang in it. The yang has a little bit of yin in it. If they were pure states, they could never interact. If we were purely trapped in a state of ignorance or in a state of our lesser selves, how could we ever get to the greater self? Yes? But the little yin in, in the yang or little yang in the yin, this is like a portal. This is like a window. This is like a gateway that allows us to move from the lesser to the greater. And it, it's, it's reversible. Okay, this requires constant practice, and we know what happens when we fail to practice well enough. Uh, the gateway within, you know, the, uh, the greater self also leads right back to the lesser. If we become too wise in our own conceit, then immediately the lesser self remanifests itself. This is what Thomas Hobbes said, a great English philosopher. He said, if I had read as much as other men, I would know as little. <laughs> because there's this, often this conceit that comes with erudition, and we need to remain humble to the entire, and the Taoists knew this too. So that's the I Ching's wisdom also. Yes, we have at any moment this choice. Again, Bernice was talking about this agency of choice. It's amazing how we were paired up in this program, and you guys, without collusion, we're actually harmonizing incredibly well. So the I Ching is saying, look, at every juncture, you have a choice. You can choose the wiser or the more foolish course. It's up to you. <laughs> And of course, here are a few hints, you know, in case you want to choose the wiser one, somehow it's easier for us to choose the more foolish one. We're born, you know, with that great facility. Easy to be a fool. I like the Hebrew expression for fool. You know that there's, a, there, there's somebody here from Israel, she knows that the, 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 the vernacular in Hebrew for a fool is, you don't say someone's a fool, you say chacham balayla. It means wise by night. <laughs> when everyone's asleep, oh, I'm very wise. When nothing's happening in the world, but you know. Wise by night equals foolish. But it's the same idea that if we understand from our foolish mistakes, which we're bound to make, also then we can use them as a basis for learning to be more wise and for moving into that sphere from the lesser to the greater. And for Lao Tzu, the greater self emerges only when we refuse to give priority to the lesser. He wrote of the sage, is it not because he is not self-interested that his self-interest is established? This is, this is readily appreciable by athletes, musicians, and other performers. You know this perfectly well. When one is performing well, when you're at your best in a so-called zone, yeah, they say you're in a zone and you can do nothing wrong, there is total immersion in the process along with one-pointedness of mind, but no self-consciousness. You're not really there. Your lesser self is gone. You're in this moment. You're doing the thing you practiced. You're one with it. It's flowing. It's beautiful. Therefore, greatness can emerge. The lesser self and its self-interested voice are stilled. But as soon as one allows the lesser self to think, oh, I'm performing well today, that puts an end to wellness very swiftly. The lesser self distracts the greater self, causing it to lose focus. Being self-interested in this lesser way derails greatness time and again. So the team that was leading blows the lead because they think, oh, we've won, and so forth. By contrast, uh, but the same holds true in our everyday lives. Th this, is a, this is a thing we can all take away. We're all performing in a certain sense. Those who are self-interested in egoistic, narcissistic, avaricious, or other self-regarding ways will not be able to establish a wholesome presence in the world. They will not work or play well with others and will not attract others who are genuinely interested in them. Hence, their lesser self-interests will obstruct, impede, or even preclude their greater ones, calling to mind ants mention also of these impediments. By contrast, those who are not consumed by self-interest in these lesser ways, who experience at least periods of liberation from the fetters of egoism, narcissism, and avarice, who forget about the lesser self and instead take an interest in others, these people, all of us at these great times, will be able to establish a wholesome presence in the world, work and play well with others, and will attract others who are generally interested in us. Not being self-interested in lesser ways allows the greater self, along with its greater interests, to emerge and become established. And such was the wisdom of Lao Tzu. 
Buddhism has explored the cultivation of the greater self to even greater extents than Stoicism and, and Taoism. To such a great extent, in fact, that the greater self may even turn out to be a non-self. And we touched on that today as well, so let me elaborate a little bit. Notwithstanding doctrinal differences between and among many Buddhist schools and traditions, most Buddhists subscribe to the original teaching of Shakyamuni concerning anatman, or lack of a permanent or enduring selfhood. Buddha's second noble truth, uh, as articulated in the sublime doctrine of dependent origination, gives rise to two mind-shaking ideas, the first of which Richard mentioned at dinner last night and again uh, was mentioned today, and that is the interconnectedness of all beings and processes. The second mind-shaking idea is that no entity in this universe, from planets to persons, from quarks to quasars, has any permanent underlying essence. Nowhere is there a thing called selfhood, and nothing exists that possesses it. The lesser self is therefore a kind of illusion. And investing this illusory lesser self with power and importance is a recipe for every kind of suffering. The greater self, which does not suffer, which does not cause others to suffer, and which works to alleviate suffering, is at bottom a non-self. Being a non-self, it is not born and does not die. That question came up this morning, too, in this vicinity. It looks like you've changed your seats, though. Everything moves. <laughs> this self, which is a non-self, does not, does not, is not born and does not die, and it's cultivated by practicing the Eightfold Way. And if you don't believe me, take it from Basho. He could have been one of the Marx brothers, you know, Chico, Harpo, Camo, Zeppo, Basho, <laughs> Basho, but great, a great and very humorous Zen poet, haiku poet, and, and this is one of his more famous haiku, this road. No one goes down it, autumn evening. Try this at home, it's a right season. No one goes down it. I, I will tell you a very, fun, I think it's funny. I'll tell you a funny story. It's a true story. I was in San Francisco once shopping in Chinatown for Buddhists, uh, you know, a little Buddha. I wanted to bring back a little Buddha for somebody. So I went into one of these emporiums, you know, which had shelves and shelves, like miles and shelves, full of every conceivable Buddha, every shape, size, you know, material price. And I, and I was followed by um, you know, the proprietors looked like daughter. It was a family enterprise, and she followed me at a discreet distance very politely, or maybe she was working on commission. I don't know, but she followed me around the store. And they had also behind the cash an altar with a Buddha, and they were burning incense to this. So I looked around the store, and I was just amazed. By, and I, at one point, I just stopped, and I turned to her, and I said, so many Buddhas. And she looked very, very concerned and, uh, and, and earnest and, and, and said to me, there's only one Buddha. So I turned to her, and I, this was one of the funniest things that's ever happened to me. I just turned to her and spontaneously I said, there's no Buddha. <laughs> and she looked, her eyes grew wide as saucers. She looked very panicked at this, and then she ran off to burn some more incense to the one Buddha. <laughs> so there may not even be a Buddha. Westerners have particular difficulty understanding this doctrine. That is, there's no Buddha outside of you. Yes? It's not external. Westerners do have difficulty understanding this doctrine and experiencing its empirical benefits, the doctrine of non-selfhood, primarily because so many Western philosophical and psychological traditions are steeped in pursuits that reify and inflate the lesser self to the neglect, often, of the greater non-self. And Descartes' cogito, I think, therefore I am, this is a perfect example, entails a commitment to the mental existence of a lesser self. Yeah, there's somebody in there. I got to get to know him. Right? <laughs> this, is the, this is the lesser self. Hobbes inverted this. Most people don't know that Descartes invited objections to the meditations and published six of them in the original. And they're available in French and in English, 1634. He was a very open minded philosopher, but he would not publish Hobbes' objection because Hobbes was a materialist. And Hobbes said, Rene, you have it exactly backwards. You are, therefore, you think. But still, Hobbes is making an appeal, yes? In this case, Hobbes' materialistic inversion likewise entails a commitment this time to the physical existence of a lesser self. Oh, there's somebody there because there's a body. You see, it's the same mistake made in a different way. Nietzsche's Ubermensch, is a, if you don't mind the criticism, is, a, is an elevation of a lesser self to a greater height. But a lesser self who views the world from the summit of Mount Everest remains a lesser self, even though it stands in a high place. 
Similarly, Sartre's laudable moral stance in assuming responsibility for his choice is the other side of the coin of liberty, Bernice, as, as you know, Frankel knew and Sartre also knew at the same time period, responsibility is still a celebration in Sartre's case of the lesser self, which ultimately collapses under the weight of solipsism. And even the most wholesome of moral positions, like Buber's I-Thou dialectic, still places emphasis on an enlightened ego, which is a contradiction in terms. Freud and many subsequent Western psychologists have subscribed to something that could be called a myth, namely the myth of the healthy ego. I, I happen to believe that's an oxymoron. The Freudian ego is nothing other than a lesser self, a chaotic cocktail of aggregates that give rise to desires, aversions, attachments, and all the myriad sufferings that they pull in their train. The ego cannot be made healthy, but it can be made quiescent, which enables the greater self to emerge. Well, thank you so much. So here's a litmus test for you, all right? I mean, this is, and this, what we had this, Virginia mentioned Augustine yesterday, so I was obliged to say this, you know? If we want to start examining the dark side of the lesser self, yes, we're gonna find some very deep and interesting things wrong with the human being. But if we're gonna talk about the greater self, we have to at some point ask not what's wrong with us, what's right with us? And this is the thing I do with my clients. A lot of them have had a lot of psychotherapy, some of them none at all, they don't want the stigma, and everybody's been concerned with finding out what's wrong with them. And we have lots of ways theologically and psychologically and pharmacologically of discovering there's something wrong, there's something wrong. But there's also something right, that's the other handle. The handle by which we can bear ourselves in life more nobly is by asking what's right with us, let's, let's work on that for a change. So here's a litmus test for you. When exposed to the poisons of existence, which Shakespeare termed in the mouth of Hamlet as the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, such poisons as confront us every day. I'm hearing a lot of this from people at work during the question period. We all apparently are working with uh, under the lesser selves of others, uh, uh, groaning under their weight, yes? <laughs> the lesser self becomes unwell. When confronted by these poisons, the lesser self becomes unwell, while the greater self transforms them into medicines. As Nichiren Buddhists remind us, this was Nagarjuna's observation about the Lotus Sutra. It is a physician that can transform poison into medicine. This is one of the most powerful and empowering teachings of Mahayana Buddhism. And I believe it is tantamount, if not equivalent, to cultivating the greater self. It is the greater self that allows us to make this transformation. And I think Daisaku Ikeda is saying just this in many different ways and also in your handout. By contrast, the rampant unhappinesses of contemporary Amer America, including epidemics of depression, obesity, ADHD, insomnia, sexual dysfunction, the catalog is endless to name but a few, plus the epidemic consumption of prescription medications that purport to cure these conditions, all stem from over-cultivating the lesser self. And if the lesser self continues to be over-cultivated in place of the greater one, this culture may implode. That's my 30-second Jeremiah. Every philosophy lecture has to have a little Jeremiah. And for example, I need not remind you that a primary cause of America's economic collapse in 2008 and at all levels was greed. Avarice. And avarice is not a psychiatric illness. Avarice is not in the DSM. And avarice is not treatable with drugs. <laughs> Buddhists call it a mental toxin, a vice that arises from deluded cravings, which emanate always from the lesser self and never from the greater. And finally, a case study. And Bernice, you know what this is. And your mother also probably knows what it is. So some of you don't, and I will explain. Uh, I received, I was contacted by a physician uh, who had a patient and he needed a philosophical consultation about his patient. This physician uh, was a geriatric doctor and he, so he was caring for, for you know, el more elderly people. And one of his patients, who was also a friend, was in his late 80s and was from Hungary and had lived through the Nazi occupation of Hungary as a non-Jew. But he had also lost family members because the Nazis were not particular about who they murdered at times, and some of them were some of his family members were not cooperating or, you know, in other ways were causing problems, and they were also casualties of this, fatal casualties of this of this massive problem. And uh, he, this particular guy in his late 80s now, who was physically in reasonable, actually pretty good health, and had all his faculties intact, the doctor said his problem was this that as a young, as a teenager during the Nazi occupation, he had under extreme duress 
been obliged to disclose the identities of some Jewish children who were being very courageously sheltered by Christian families at huge risk to themselves. And uh, the Nazis put all kinds of pressure, you know, torture and all kinds of other things because they knew or suspected this to be the case. And this man, who's this elderly man now, we're speaking this year, was, was, was forced to reveal, and he never got over it. He never, because he survived, he never got over the fact that these children were then, you know, rounded up by the Nazis, deported, and probably died, most of them, if not all of them, in the camps. So he, he had carried this all his life, and it was very bitter for him. And then, in his, just last year, his family had a reunion in Hungary, and they went on a cruise down the Danube. And then he encountered this. And this, these are shoes on the banks of the Danube. These are shoes of the victims of the Nazi roundup. And they're a monument to the Holocaust, shoes on the bank of the Danube across from the parliament buildings. And when this elderly man saw those shoes, he had a complete breakdown because it brought back to him in vivid graphic detail you know, his, his being caught up in all of that. He became depressed, you know, clinically depressed. He lost his appetite. He lost his will to live. He lost the meaning of life. And this doctor is saying, I don't think this guy needs psychotherapy. I don't think this guy needs psychoanalysis. He's 88. What's he going to do, spend 10 years on a couch? And, and I don't think he needs Prozac. And this is with the medical doctor saying, what can I do for this guy? So he's contacting a philosopher. Why? Well, maybe, maybe for good reason. What I said to him was the following, because this is a real case, and we talked for, for, you know, at length, and then I said, look, I don't think there's anything we can do for this guy. I think we're trying to treat his lesser self again, to put it in our context. What he needs is to do something for himself. And what this doctor did not know was the theory of karma. It was a very good opportunity to explain to him about the ripening fruits of action, and some ripen more quickly and some ripen more slowly, and he had been carrying these, these now very rotten fruits around a long time and could not get the taste out of his mouth. What's he going to do? And you know, remorse is good, yes, and important. At times, it's important for us to recognize that we've been party to wrongdoing. That's important. But to torture oneself with guilt for a whole life is also, in a way, self-indulgent and not productive. This is the lesser self. This is the mischief of the lesser self, making us feel interminably guilty without a, a means of expiation. So the philosophical prescription in this case was, I think, a very simple one. He has to make medicine out of this poison. You can't go back and change the past. We can do nothing about the past, but we can do everything about the future. And so I suggested that there are lots of children in the world today who need help. Some of them may even be Jewish children, but there's lots of children. It doesn't matter whether they're Jewish or not. There are children in the world who need food, who need medicine, who need care, who need education. Help them, for heaven's sake. This guy's well off. He's retired. He, he has a, s a sound mind and a sound body. If he wants to change his own karma, he can do it now by doing good in the world, by getting out of the lesser self that is tormenting himself with the past unfortunate circumstances of his life. Let him make good cause and let him start doing something for children today. This doctor said, it was like a revelation because medicine is a little narrow in this case. They're not thinking necessarily about philanthropy. They're thinking about the patient's health. But in some cases, the patient's health is a matter of what can we do for others. This will release him from the bondage of his self-imprisonment and will do a great power of good in the world. And that's a contribution you know, of a partnership sometimes between philosophy and medicine. And, 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 that's, and that's the message. It's obviously consonant with everything we've said today. Each one of us has, at every moment, an opportunity to escape from this prison of our lesser selves and think, what can we do out there? And that changes our karma, and it makes everybody else's world a better place to live in, in the end of the day, including our own, too, if we're really there. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. <laughs>